It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't <laughs> trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Let's start with, like, uh, I guess Black Lives Matter, because that's the least complicated topic of the two. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, the CRT um, issue to me seems a little bit, like, misplaced a little bit, because um, I'm not even sure if, like, to be honest, when it comes to CRT, oh, I'll get into that a bit since we're talking about BLM. Um, yeah, my thoughts on BLM is that um, I think it's um, I think it's a good movement overall. At least I agree with the sentiment and the message and what it stands for or at least what it stands for in theory. Um, I'm not in favor of like a bunch of latched on stuff. Like um, I know that there's people who join, uh, who are part of BLM or part of a BLM organization, this or that BLM organization. And they like to inject a bunch of like Marxist type stuff or whatever. Um, and I'm not trying to be an exaggerating here. Like it's a lot of anti-capitalist sentiments and a lot of like um, a lot of other issues that aren't related to the main thing. And the main thing really is the treatment of black people in our justice system in both in terms of like uh, judicially when it comes to prosecutions and also like in terms of law enforcement, that seems to be the main core issue. Um, because as I recall, um, this, this whole thing kicked off with um, the shooting of Trayvon Martin um, in which um, I forget the guy's name, but um, some guy shot George him. Zimmerman. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Um, he shot this guy after he was like, uh, and it was a weird case. Cause like he got on the phone with the police and the police told him not to go after him, but he decided to do it anyway. And he shot the kid. Um, and after the, uh, the kid, there was apparently some kind of an altercation. Um, but the police just like let him go casually. Um, and this started like a big, uh, pushback. And I think this is like the first time we saw social media really play a role in these, in this kind of situation where someone dies and then there's a big controversy over that. Um, and basically like there were, even then there was like some extreme reactions. Like some people are actually calling for his assassination, which is just like, what the hell? But um, regardless, um, I, I find that to be like, uh, you can easily see why that's problematic. Cause like immediately they're letting this guy off um, after killing this black kid. Um, even, uh, even though like it real like, um, it really did seem like he he was guilty, um, at least of like killing him unjustly, unjustly, especially since the police told him not to do anything. And he, at the very least, George Zimmerman could have like, you know, backed down and not gone after him. Um, and like, I remember that. Uh, and I remember also as a con, there was, and, and again, I'm not using George Zimmerman as an example to say that, yeah, this is like, um, he was like totally guilty and that this is like the end all be all. But in that case, um, I think that they did overcharge him with like second degree murder. I don't think they could have gotten him on that. They probably should have went to third degree murder. And that was something that was actually talked about in the news. And it turned out to be correct. Um, because in some jurisdictions, they can't just um, make the charge go down a bit. Um, but it's not just one or two specific, oh, a few specific cases. Like there's other ones we can talk about. Like um, um, there was a guy in New York. I remember he got killed by an officer and he was also black. Um, he did have like some misdemeanor charges in his background and, um, the medical examiner determined that he died from an illegal chokehold. So it wasn't a case of like, um, the police officer, like, um, was, you know, in like, a gray situation or something like that. It was a case of like where the facts they were show that the guy was, um, pretty much guilty. Um, actually, no, I think it, no, it showed he was guilty because he was ultimately fired for this. Um, and unlike some other cases where BLM supports someone when the facts of the case didn't support the given narrative, um, which I'll agree that happens as well. But there's been time, plenty of cases where there are police who act um, with extreme brutality and um, there's always a black guy that gets killed. Um, there's also this kid with like, there was also this case where this, um, I think this kid had asthma or something like that. And he was like telling the police to like back off as they were manhandling him and he ended up dying. Um, and his crime was just walking down the street. Um, and there's been plenty of cases after cases. And there cases. was also this one case with the yeah. toy gun, if I'm not mistaken, too. Because I remember hearing a story about a toy gun and the police officer shooting that kid, too. I think that was in Ohio. 
Yeah. Um, it, it was definitely in, in Ohio. And I, I remember that one too. That was a really um, bad one. But um, reality, um, I'll just ask you this. Like, um, how do you feel about reparations? Um, I don't like, again, I think it's like, well, what, what do you mean about, rep- what do you mean reparations? Like you mean for like slavery, Jim Crow, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, cause I know that that's, um, to an extent, a part of the, um, kind of BLM, um, kind of talking points that like there are certain kind of subgroups within BLM who, who do advocate for it. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, um, I'll preface this first with like, um, I don't think the reparations are like corely part of the main issues that BLM is talking about. Um, which again, the most prominent issue seems to be the treatment of black people within our justice system. Ultimately, um, that's the main one. This, the reparations seems to be a separate issue. It's probably related, which is why it's being brought up. Um, however, that being said, um, to answer the question directly, um, I think that like reparations should at least be talked about and considered. Um, because I think that to a certain extent, there is a case for reparations, um, for people who are descendants of slaves, because there's two, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One, like uh, the obvious one, slavery, like, uh, you, when you enslave someone, force them to work, you're getting, uh, you're benefiting off of their unpaid labor. Now I'm not like a Marxist or anything like that. Again, I'm a capitalist. I don't believe in like, uh, you know, that you're owed, um, uh, that you're owed like a, a title to like part of the company or something like that. I think that's silly. However, your work should be paid for, or at the very least, you should at least, you know, consent to it. And these people were forced and saying that they didn't consent to it's kind of putting it mildly. They were, um, in some cases, taken from their homes from overseas and shipped here. Um, Or they were descendants of those people who were shipped over here, and they were just born into it, and they didn't have a choice. That ultimately is wrong. And that uh, that labor was a was done under a non-consensual like relationship in which they never agreed to it at all. Um, giving back that money to their descendants, I think is justified for that reason, because if you owe debt to someone, I don't think the debt disappears in most, in most cases because the person died. Sometimes it does, but I think it's like to banks and stuff like that. Like if you owe, like generally speaking, you would just pay back the debt to those who, who would owe the money. Um, and I do think the government's responsible for perpetuating this. So giving reparations to like slavery and also to Jim Crow as well, I think, because there was also a lot of denial of rights and privileges does matter even to the sense today, because they're also denied intergenerational wealth, which a lot of white people don't have that problem. And a lot of other groups don't have that problem. Now, how exactly reparations would be doled out is problematic, as would if this is even a feasible thing, like due to economic reasons. Um, And I don't really have an answer to that. Um, so we should be at least open to this because I think it is the right thing to do. Um, and it would also alleviate, it wouldn't completely alleviate, um, systemic issues with poverty and the like, um, which does lead to like, in, um, which I'm not sure if I want to say this, but in, in theory, at least, um, it leads to more crime and stuff like that. Okay. Like, um, a comment yeah, about the reparations things because sure. more, more or less I do agree like the people, you know, who got to this country were enslaved. And yes, I do agree that, of course, slavery is bad. All this stuff, you know, what we're talking about, police brutality is bad. But at the same time, like, you know, my big concern about the reparations for me, at least, is probably the fact that, of course, like many people who are alive today, the black people who are alive, did not even experience slavery. There are some people, of course, that's of course, experienced like the civil rights movement. And so I guess, you know, if you were to give like reparations to people who, you know, serve in the civil rights movement for like the mistreatment of them, I would say like that sounds pretty, you know, reasonable. But as far as, you know, giving money for like, you know, for slavery, I'm not sure about that because during the civil war, of course, like, you know, both sides gathered together to fight, you know, against like the Confederates. And more or less, it was about, you know, I guess it's more complicated than that, but more or less about slavery. And so I think, you know, as far as the reparation, how it was paid back then, I think it was like, you know, through the battles and the blood and the sacrifices that people had made for the country. And then after, of course, like the battle for the Civil War, the government for the United States gave like the African, like the people who were free, like a land in Africa called Liberia, to also go into those kind of countries, you know, to settle there if they really don't want to say United States. And so I think in terms of reparation, it was paid through blood. And I think it was also paid through like, you know, 
Liberia for like the slavery aspect. But as far as like you know reparations for like you know civil rights, I have no problems with that kind of reparations. Okay. Um. There's uh. There's a um. A fact. There's one factual thing I want to correct. Um. About Liberia. Um. Liberia was it was an event that happened. Yes. Um. It was actually like um. It was kind of like one of the solutions. I forget exactly who. Um. I forget exactly the specifics about how it was set up, but the Liberia movement happened before the Civil War. Not. It wasn't like afterwards. Um. I think that they had stopped um the idea of like um sending black people to other countries um by the time the civil war ended i think um so that i just wanted to point that out um but that's okay because it's more of a side point doesn't really have to do with the main point you're making um yeah like uh the 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 issue why i don't agree that like reparations don't need to be given because of like well i mean let me let me um think this through first okay so you said uh, it was paid. Well, while you stick it through, I'll go ahead and give some more points that I think so far. Also, like, as far as, like, you know, um, it's also kind of, you know, I'm worried about it, too, because, like, if you were to, you know, ask, you know, all the white people in this country, you know, to pay for reparations, my biggest concern besides, you know, the debt being paid to the blood has to be, of course, like, you know, giving money, like, the money process, because... Slavery was also very multifaceted because besides, you know, the white people, the Europeans taking the black people to America, we have also the problems of, you know, the black people also selling the black people to go to America. And so I'm just kind of curious, how would it work out? Like, would the black people who sell, like, you know, the slaves to, you know, America would also, you know, get, they like, have to pay reparations too, or... And also for white people, of course, like the white people today are not even guilty of what happened in the past. Like, you know, the concept of original sin is like, you know, I feel like the concept of that is applying to, you know, the reparations here because it's almost feel like, you know, the white people should also feel guilty of something that they have not partaken in. And you can go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I just kind of wanted to, to say the other thing, um, and this is something that I've, I've thought about as, as well, is... Um, how do we determine if reparations were to go ahead? How will we determine which people would pay? Because, I mean, here's the thing. There was a lot of people who were not involved in, in this, in, in owning slaves, in, in, in trading in them or anything like that. So, I mean, like, let's just say, for example, um, like a, a second generation Italian who's like Italian American. Are we going to ask his family to pay for something that took place well before they came to the United States? You know, you can't just be like, this fellow is is this color, therefore he must pay, and this fellow is that color, therefore he must receive. You know, it's 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 going it's it's very complicated. Um, it's also, I, I think it's actually impossible to to properly. Um, like compute the actual amount because and and to some people the other thing is also what amount is going to be sufficient to them did one group's family suffer more than others no is that what they're going to believe you know is are they going to have documentation because i mean you're you're you can't just walk up to to say i don't know the the reparation payment center and be like okay um my family suffered more through due to slavery Therefore, I deserve more money. You know, it, it, it it's a very, very, very complicated an thing. Sure. Okay, so so the answer is like, as far as Italians go, we're not going to retroactively um, like say you're Italian, therefore you must pay. I think I think a better solution would be, oh, the Italian government signed a contract a hundred years ago that said they would do this, and they still haven't done this. Therefore, we're going to hold um, the Italian government to this contract that they signed or for America, we signed a contract that as a freed slave, you were entitled to 40 acres and a mule. So I think a, a simple solution for this, as far as like who could ask or who could be entitled for that is say, if you can directly trace your lineage back to a slave in America, then you should probably be t entitled to a portion of this at least, or say, say if you, if, if you were, or if your ancestor was like a slave in America and then they later had eight kids, then 
now that 40 acres and a mule is divided eight ways between those eight people who are still alive today to make them whole. Yeah, like I think what Three Glad says on the right track because you're right. These objections, I don't think these objections are like fundamentally ridiculous that you bring up because, as I said before, the logistics of it and how exactly it would be done and the best way to implement it would be extremely complicated. Um, but I don't actually wait. Let me let me complicated, not extremely complicated. Um, I know that we do. I know that we do give reparations to like Indians for like land stolen stuff like that um, to certain tribes and whatnot. Like um, we, the government gives them money based on like a certain percentage or something like that. I forget. I don't know exactly how it is, but I know that reparations are paid by the United States to Indian, um, to Indian nations um, within the United States, because of course nothing in the United States law can be like simple. Um, And that's, and and that's compensating for somewhat of like some of the um, excesses of the United States government to say the least. Something along those lines could be done. Like ultimately, I think the state government, like the federal government or and the various state governments would be the ones ultimately held responsible. Now, when it comes to like um black slaveholders in um like in African nations or whatnot, and um I also think that like other nations, like I think um like I know that like uh in other nations abroad, um it would be a little bit more difficult to have them pay reparations for that. Not impossible though. But you might be able to do that if there was some sort of like treaty or negotiation made for that. However, the problem with that is now we get into like, you know, things about of matters of practicality where, yeah, ideally every single person that was involved with the slave trade would basically um, pay reparations. But the problem with this is that like um, you can't really atomize, individualize it because now you're just going back and now you're just going to be like basically paying compensation for like sins of the father at that point. If we just like make this so that way. Oh, yeah. Like. 70 like 100 years ago your uh grandparents um ha- owned slaves so you got to pay this black guy um that much money i don't think that would be fair i don't think it'd be right and like basic and i don't think it would even be feasible in the first place but i do think that like um for example like something of like uh something based on the 48 acres and the mule promise which was made by i think one of the presidents promised that and it was basically never delivered um like a recognition that yeah like they are owed reparations um, it doesn't have to be literally like the land value of 40 acres and the the animal, the the trade value of the mule at the time, or you know the uh, inflate um account for inflation of these dollars. But that principle, I think, um, would be a good reason for reparations. So ultimately, I think the governments would pay for it. Um, I guess a follow up to that would be how would like this affect on um, the budget and the economy? To which I imagine that we basically um. We would just uh, we would basic basically we would probably tax uh rich people or corporations um to pay that uh to pay that off essentially um because I, yeah like uh yeah like uh that that would just that'd be my preference for that um because I for a couple of reasons one I don't think that like um I don't think people making under a certain amount should be paying more taxes and two um I, I just don't I think that they would it would be kind of unfair if like everyone's taxes went up uh if the if Basically, if the if the middle and lower classes, um, their taxes were raised because of this would be kind of BS, especially if they had nothing to do with it. So, yeah. Uh, Ernest, you want to respond to some of the economic sure. stuff, sir? Um, yeah, I now like I can I can see the point, and and you guys are making very very good points. I personally, you know, what I like to see the rights the wrongs righted. Absolutely. Um, however, I think that because of, you know, just the, the population of today accounting for inflation and just the the sheer logistics of it, I, I think that it, like a fine, an actual like financial um, kind of reparations is not only impossible, but it's probably going to bankrupt it would probably bankrupt the United States, which is already uh, pretty strapped for cash as it is. Um, So, I mean, like in in reality, I don't think it's a feasible thing. Now, there are other ways that that reparations can be obtained. They don't have to be a a material um, kind of um, transaction, you know, and, and, and really can a physical amount of money actually kind of make up for for the wrongs i mean that's that's uh it it, it, it's not an easy question to answer and everyone would probably look at this this bit differently 
So I think that instead of like financial reparations, I think what should be done is is reexamining the way justice is is delivered and other and other things are delivered within the United States. I think for me, like and, and this is coming from someone who is um of indigenous descent. You know, I'm I'm a card carrying um native Canadian. Um so you know I, I, I look at things from a a bit of a perspective here. And the way I see it is that if you really want to kind of right the wrongs, the best way to do that is through equalizing the playing field. And that means ensuring that, you know, minority businesses, indigenous, um, black, you know, and, and are given the opportunities to, um, you know, participate in the market um, and are able to grow and develop and, and create um, this kind of intergenerational wealth. Because that 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 would be, I think, probably the best thing. I'm not sure what you guys would think. Do do natives in Canada do do they have similar rights to how they do in America? Where like, if you can trace your lineage back, you you can open casinos and not pay taxes. Uh, Are there some? It, it honestly, the casino thing in I I live in a place called Newfoundland. So Newfoundland, there are no casinos allowed. It's 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 not. So that part is a no, but if you can't trace your, your lineage, there are other things. Like um, if I bought a new car um, and I presented my, my status card, they would have to take it to a reserve here on the island and the transaction would be technically competed there. So then I wouldn't have to pay any taxes on it. Um, other things, though, I, I do have to pay taxes, like if I buy a house or anything like that. The government is nice, but they're not that nice. Um I- the point in me asking is to is to try to paint the picture that it might be easy for you to say that like even though you're a minority in Canada, that like the shit can can get better or that we can get past our like minority hurdles. But I think it, it might it might just be easy for you to say when when you're when you don't have as many hurdles as uh, as like black people do in that regard for the I, I, the wrongs that have been done to your community. Well, I I actually take issue with that because I mean if um if you look at the way native uh, Canadians and native Americans have been treated, it, it hasn't been exactly, um, you know, a better uh, kind of a, a field of flowers either. You know, there's, there's been, lots I'm not of trying wrong. to say that either. I'm well, sorry if I came off that way. No, 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 no. You know, it's no problem. Like I, I don't take these things personally, but I mean, like the way, the way I see it is that every group has had some kind of discrimination at, at some point in time for the most part. You know, you look at the Irish, look at the Italians, you, you look at um, the black population, you look at the, the Latino population. Everyone has experienced some form of hurdle. Uh, the, the, the Chinese I, and the Japanese in the United States, they were thrown in I, the camps. I can agree with all those. I just think the hurdles for, like, for, for black people and for people of color, are those hurdles still haven't really been climbed over yet. Uh, Versus no. like, like yeah. Irish people, I think they've kind of climbed over those hurdles too. Sorry, Tyler. Um, so I was just gonna say, like, reality can talk. He had his yeah. hands up. Yeah. Okay. So, um, on like uh, the the point about reparations for other groups, I think that should also be discussed as well. Um, depending on the context, like, I think there's a case that could be made that like, um, Italians and Japanese people specifically, um, their descendants should probably get reparations as well because they were put into camps. Uh, I think during World Wars One and Two, respectively, uh, the Italians were like suspect for some reason, and they put them into camps and stuff like that. Um, against their will because they were like investigating like um, people of certain ethnicities and racial groups and uh, the Japanese as well. Um, I think it was worse for the Japanese though, because basically there was this really hardcore um, I get like, there was this really hardcore anti-Japanese sentiment in the United States. Um, and like, I think it was, I'm not sure if the, I'm not sure if it was FDR himself who ordered it, but essentially they suspected that all Japanese people were essentially like, I think, suspect- he, did. I think he did directed it. Yeah. Well, it was, it yeah. was FD, it was FDR. He was, he was pretty, uh, he, he really didn't like the Japanese. Yeah. So if we're um, talking about like uh, reparations for civil rights violations, um, I think that definitely qualifies. And I'm actually curious if any of those people who were put into internment camps are even still alive today. Or George this issue ever... Um, there's like uh, that Star Trek guy. He's still alive. yeah, George Takei. Yeah, he yeah. he was in he was in the camps. Yeah, 
yeah, like I think that like when the government abuses power, they they should definitely um, give up races or that kind of stuff. Um, that's a little bit more problematic though, but I don't think it's that problematic. Um, because... I think the last time I checked, they did give like reparations to the Japanese people in those camps. Oh, okay. Well, if yeah. they did that, then that would then go on the U.S. government for that. Um, it would be it would have been great if they didn't do that in the first place. But um, the point of reparations is to correct something that's been wronged. Um, or yeah. Um, oh, there's also another point I wanted to address. Um, like, uh, giving reparations by, instead of, like, giving, like, financial reparations, um, why not instead fix the problem? Uh, the problems today that, are so, uh, that um, Black people face um, with law enforcement that BLM is complaining about and issue, other issues of systemic racism. Um, I don't disagree. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. The question is if, like, um, the, the discussion of reparations of, like, um, is if financial reparations should be given as well is given as well because I'm all in favor of like fixing our problems when it comes to like the racial disparities um, that uh, that are directly resulted from um, the history of this nation affecting like basically uh, black families that um, who's who's uh, of today because again the, the generational wealth the, the denial of generational wealth hurts. And that's that's a problem that I don't think was ever fully addressed. And a lot of these racial attitudes that we have, um, I guess, getting more of the core issue, um, they they are still perpetuated today. Um, and I don't think we can just like chalk it up to coincidence that, like, uh, for example, all these um, a lot a lot of these high profile police cases of like police brutality are um, affecting innocent black guys. Okay, now we already talked about the reparation stuff, but. Um... I want to go into something else, something different, because sure. the movement Black Lives Matter, and of course, for this conversation, we're going to talk about Black Lives Matter, the movement, and not, you know, the activists. Because to me, there's like a big difference between like, you know, the movement and the actions of the leaders versus, you know, some people on the street. So we're going to, for the sake of the conversation, we're going to talk about the movement. Okay. So it's completely different things. So now I think the movement itself, was kind of founded on a faulty premise. What do I mean by a faulty premise? For starters, if you were to say, like, you know, I don't support Black Lives Matter, I think it's some sort of trap, where more or less, if somebody were to say something negative against it, then somebody, you know, who was, like, you know, on the extreme fringes of the spectrum for the political stuff, will probably say, that's evidence of me just being racist right now. And so, the way that the, the words Black Lives Matter, you know, started kind of feels kind of suspect because more or less they could use that against you if you were to speak out against it. So what do you guys think about that? I think that might have applied a lot more when Black Lives Matter was new. I know I know it definitely definitely ruffled my feathers a little bit when it was new, but I think at, at this day, like I think every reasonable person who like understands a little bit of politics understands what BLM is. And I don't think it's like a worthy excuse these days. Right. And what about you, Ernest, in reality? What do you guys think? Am I right? Or... Uh, uh, I'll answer first. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's like a trap. Like, I don't think it's a trap, um, per se. It depends on how, like, uh, I, I guess that would all depend on, like, the context of it. Like, if someone um, says that they don't support Black Lives Matter, like, the implication is that they're opposed to it directly. Um, I guess it might depend on, like, the context of what they're talking about. Um, I... I don't know if that like um I, i'd have to think about them a little bit um because i don't want to say that it's correct for people to not support the movement i think that it would be the correct thing to do for everyone to support because it seems kind of obvious that there's something wrong they don't have to agree with every position that every single person that has said who waves the black lives matter flag but they should agree with like the core uh problem of systemic issues that's the thing that they should care about so I guess it depends on what the speaker is talking about. Like maybe they mean a specific organization. Or I maybe guess like, some... I think maybe like, you know, the ideas, you know, like the ideas and what the people do, probably that kind of reference, not like the core meaning, like being against police brutality. I mean, yeah. I mean, at that point, like uh, it's, it's either the person is ignorant, which they don't know any better, which um, like maybe, pe maybe I could get shit for this or whatever. But like, I think that, that a person could legitimately just not know there could be other reasons um, that could say a lot about his character um, or not, but it could be the case that the person is just isolated in their own bubble and just looking, listening to like a bunch of like um, 
I guess, far right talking points about how not everything that BLM says is false. They're a terrorist organization, blah, blah, blah. Um, which I, I think that those takes are just absurd and ridiculous. Um, and I, but at the same time, um, I also see a lot of people saying that like, oh, I don't support, like, I, I think that like, I, I, I don't know. Um, I kind of want to agree with three lead sentiment, but like, I also think that sometimes it also depends on like who's saying it and why as well. Um, like anyone who's like in, in anyone though, with full knowledge of the facts of what's happening, um, like, you know, or someone who's like a high profile figure or whatnot, I think they know and they don't have an excuse. Cause like their job is to report the news and to look up the stuff, et cetera. Um, if they're like saying that, oh yeah, I don't support the movement, even though there's a clear problem here. Um, then yeah, they're just full of it at that point. But some people can just be ignorant. Um, it depends. I guess it depends on. Again, it comes down to who's saying it and what it what and how they came to that conclusion. Okay, Ernest, you want to say anything about that? Um, no, I'm I'm rather in agreement with you, Tyler. To be honest, um, I I actually think though, like like while I understand the the sentiment behind um, the movement, I think that the people who are, are kind of the, the guiding force behind it have taken it and um, have turned it into something that it, it is probably going to end up doing a lot more harm than good. I mean, we've already seen some of the, the hypocrisy of some of the kind of like the, the, the quote unquote founders of it. And more so, or less like uh, yeah. they've been caught, you know, from the last time I checked, buying like mansions with like um what was it millions of dollars i can't remember the exact number but like millions of dollars to buy those mansions at some yeah, point and, and and it wasn't in like like oakland or or in you know like a, a a traditionally kind of black neighborhood these are generally you know very um caucasian neighborhoods <laughs> um which i mean is, is kind of funny when 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 you're someone who's saying like you know you're you're scared of um you know of these kind of like these these white interactions i guess um you know it, it's kind of strange that you go to a neighborhood full of of you know like like white people it just doesn't really it doesn't really make much sense to me um and makes sense to me well, I mean, well, are you assuming that like a white neighborhood is a safe neighborhood? Is that is that kind of the the thinking behind it, or? Yeah, I I think uh, that, I think that's the implication. The implication is like they're going to a white neighborhood, which is like I'm assuming you mean a rich neighborhood when you say that. And I think that not even I think just like statistically, like the more rich neighborhoods have less police presence. And one of the big issues that BLM has is that police presence just needs to be lowered. Because in like in higher crime areas, it creates a it creates like a, a snowball effect of more police presence equals more crime equals more police presence, and it's like, yeah like never ending. Well, yeah, yeah, okay, beat okay, off each other. I, I I should have worded it more in terms of like rich neighborhoods instead of say for example like like white neighborhoods. I I, I just found it kind of um, ironic that you know like the people who 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 would say like Black Lives Matter are going to the neighborhoods that are um, probably statistically less likely to have um, fellow black lives living within them. Um, I, no, yeah, I just not... don't find it ironic. I think people who want to get away from, get who want less cops will be willing to spend more for a quality neighborhood. But but then again, and I, I think that it, as long as they're not scamming for that money, like why do we care that they bought a mansion? I mean, they could have used that money to you know help donate to causes that you know help black lives. Because they could have, if they, they didn't. Black Lives Matter, then should they, should they not use that money, you know, to help other black people? Because from what I can tell so far, there has not been any sort of statements, at least publicly from what I've seen, of them donating to help anybody else. Do you think it yeah. matters that there are kids starving in Africa? Do you I mean, think that matters? Sure. Okay, well, why aren't you doing anything? Why aren't you donating all of your money to help the starving kids in Africa? Do you not but care? But you have to. You would have to help every other cause like by making that kind of reason. You'd have to help every other cause. So I mean, like, like you'd have to help. Okay, I help the starving kids in Africa. Then I have to go and help the starving kids in Venezuela. Then I have to go and help the starving kids in I don't know Poland. You know, Either way, like, it's, it's like, just an example. Like I can care about something while also not spending all of my money but, to help that but, cause. But for black, for Black Lives Matter, 
to be about Black Lives Mattering? Shouldn't they be doing, shouldn't a lot more of the money within that organization go towards empowering and, and bettering Black lives? I mean, now, if that was the case, if that was what using Black Lives Matter uh, donations was for, you know what? I would be a lot more happy with that. I would be like, you know what? This is a good organization. You know, they're, they're helping improve educational outcomes for for black family for black people they're helping well, um i'm sorry this, this is why i said that uh that as long as they're not scamming the money to buy these mansions then it doesn't really matter like if it's their own money why do we care how they're spending their own money it, obviously if they're, if they're taking donations for blm and then buying mansions that's fucked up i mean we don't really know either way if it's like you know from like we sure don't yeah, it's like it's like it can go either way. It's like it's hard to prove a negative. Like if there's like evidence, it's like no way to know either way. But like at the uh, the main point that we're trying to make is like even if it's like their own money, even if it's like you know the organ whatever, that they should of course try to you know find ways to appu- app- to approve the Black Lives uh, of course you know they claim to fight for. I mean, I, I don't disagree with that, but I just it just seems like a I don't know. It just seems kind of lame how, like, if you if you advocate for a cause, but you don't devote your entire life to that cause, then I'm going to call you a hypocrite and get mad at you. Like, I don't know. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying they should devote their entire lives to, to said cause. But what I'm saying is that I would just like to see a little bit more of the money from Black Lives Matter being used to, to improve Black lives. Like, I, I really don't know what they really use that money for. I mean, I know a, a bit of it goes towards democrat candidates um now and then i know know that like a lot of these corporations at least in 2020 after the death of george floyd like nike and whatnot they all you know gave money to black lives matter and so i'm like also more recently in the news this week that came out apparently they lost like what 60 million dollars or something and so, again, like, I'm just coming back to the question, like, what are they doing with the money and how they're spending it? We cannot see their own personal statements. They need some sort of more accountability, like some sort of protection for, like, the people who donated to actually know where the money is going towards. And, and have a say, I, really, I think. I think the better thing would be, like, more to, to have a say where or how that money is going to be used. Because, I mean, that's like... Fair. Like if I'm if I'm don't like I find like a lot of it like I said earlier goes towards Democratic candidates and um like I might not be an American but I do keep my eye on a bit of the American politics and one thing I've noticed is that Democrat run cities um ge- generally do not have um have the best kind of track records um in in terms of um improvement in the kind of the livelihoods of, of black people. And that, that for me is a negative because you see, like I'm like, I'm, I'm a capitalist. Like I, I'm like reality. You know, I, I want <laughs> people to make money. I want people to be successful. And so I see like, I'll, I'll just be right up front. Like I see racism as, as detrimental to capitalism, you know, cause, cause you know, discrimination is, is bad business sense, you know? So, in, in reality, you know, I would like to see the improvement of, of black lives because that keeps the economy moving. That keeps capitalism strong. And that that means that everyone wins. Um, so, you know, I would like to see this money being used for that purpose. But since BLM is is admittedly and it was admitted by the, the main kind of mainstream founders that it is um, Marxist. Um, you know, that money, I, I don't, I, I really can't see it being used in an appropriate way. Rowdy, go ahead. Okay. So a couple of points. So firstly, um, I'm not sure if you and I have the exact same views on capitalism because, um, like I want like, uh, cause like if I was just pure capitalist and nothing else, then I'd probably just, uh, not care about social issues at all. I just be like, okay how can I make the most money? And that'd be just my mindset. I wouldn't be like, you know, advocating for these positions. Um, like ultimately, like I, like you're kind of right in a sense that like capitalism works better when everyone's treated more fairly, but that's not why I advocate for that. I think that like ultimately there's an underlying reason that, um, that we have these policies that we, that people that, um, carry my beliefs, I consider myself a sock them at this point. Um, won't advocate for this is because we want to, we want to make sure everyone has a fair share. Basically, everyone 
has is fairly treated with you know the dignity that they, they deserve and that everyone has true equality of opportunity not like um the um not like the type that like the not, kind of thing that we see nowadays what uh repeat that kind of like you know the equality of outcomes thing or the equity stuff that we see nowadays right sort of but not really um when i say equality of opportunity i mean that like um, not in the sense of, cons- well, of like how conservatives typically say. So conservatives will typically say that equality of opportunity is like um, everyone. Uh, it, it basically advocated for essentially what I consider eventually it's the social Darwinism, where basically everyone has gets whatever they can, they take whatever they can, and as long as the laws are fair and equal to everybody, it's okay. I don't agree with this view. I think that that's kind of like not, that kind of misses the point. Like, for example, um, I strongly, strongly advocate more than anything else that we fund for when it comes to which social programs need the most attention. Education should be the number one thing, because I think the big reason for disparity between people of like who are extremely poor versus extremely rich is level of education they're able to get. Like it's um, for one thing, we have like this property tax system um, that's kind of like the default throughout the nation of how people get um, pay for education at a basic level. And if you live in a poor area, well, you're going to get poor education as a result of that. If you live in a good, high property value area, well, when you send your kids off to preschools, they're going to get iPads to work with in order to help them teach learn. Um, now, we could get like lost in like the um, – uh, now, this is not to get lost in what specific materials are needed for kids um, and what specific costs are, but money does play a significantly large factor in this, like tiring the best teachers, getting those resources to begin with, et cetera. Um, they're going to need all that. So when it comes to equality of opportunity, it needs to be like, like if you can't stand on your own, if you don't have those safety nets, if you don't have the social programs in place, you're not going to have equality of opportunity. It's basically just um, basically everyone gets weighted, frankly, weighted dice rolls, depending on like various socioeconomic factors. Um, so that's where I would disagree with um, a conservative saying that they want. Let me rephrase that. Um I guess your average conservative saying they want equality of opportunity um, versus when I say it, um, because I, I agree equality of outcome when, in the truest sense doesn't really make a lot of sense, but like we don't get good outcomes when there's not a level playing field to begin with, or at least a baseline pl- level playing field as a very, very bare minimum. Now, go ahead, Ernest. I know you want to respond or unless Tyler wants to. It's fine. No, no, I was going to say, go ahead, Ernest. No, I just I just wanted to ask Reality, have you ever read um any uh, Capitalism and Freedom by uh, Milton Friedman? Um I don't do like I get criticism for this, but I don't read a lot of books. Um so Oh no no, no. I'm 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 not going to judge on that. Like no, but um cuz cuz I'm actually glad you you kind of talked about the, the school situation because that's something that um you see like I I'm I'm very very interested in politics and um I've I've run for office uh, a couple of times. I've never won, but I I'm getting closer. <laughs> but um but like when when you do you're involved in it um you um you, you formulate some ideas in that and and so you have to do a bit of research and do a bit of reading and et cetera et cetera so so one thing i ran into a while back was was milton friedman and in capitalism and freedom um he he mentions about um the kind of flaws behind the public school system and i, I like i said before i live on a rural place in in in, in canada um, where um, education is is not always equally distributed um, throughout my, my province. And whenever people kind of raise the, the issue and, you know, they're like, oh, maybe there needs to be uh, either more funding or, or more options, um, it gets shot down because, you know, the unions do not like the idea of having um, competition, uh, per se, that, that isn't, you know, along along their lines you know like having like within the public school system so what milton friedman came up with was the idea of of giving school vouchers and and that's something that i think can be used in conjunction with um you know a private and a public kind of school system you know multi, a, a different kind of layered or tiered uh, system and i think that can serve to help even the playing field will it be perfect Absolutely not, because nothing, no policy is perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect policy. I've, I've, I've learned that over the years. But um, I think that it would go a long way because it puts the mo- one of the most important things in the hands of people 
who w- might not have the the financial resources on their own to do anything. It gives them the choice to put their kids in in an institution that is more to their liking. And I think that that would actually help improve educational outcomes, which would then help, to some extent, level the playing field. It's, like I said, it's not perfect, but it is something. I don't know what you think about that. Um, I don't really have much comment on, like, Milton Friedman's idea. Like, I've heard of school vouchers, but I know they're, like, con- controversial as ever could be. Um, I'd have to do some serious research on that. However, sure. um, what I have heard is that, um, like, uh, if we were to give everyone like a very good education, and everyone was able to like have the tools needed in order to like advance on with their careers, like after they graduate high school, um, that the economic boon from that would basically pay for itself, or at least that's what it says in theory. Um, now, maybe someone could like show evidence that shows that, well, actually, that won't, wouldn't be the case. Um, but for me personally, I think the best way to solve the education issue, the disparity issue, is just tax the rich more. Um, and I don't say that to be like, because I hate the rich or whatever the rich even say, yeah, tax us more. Um, I say that cause that's where mo- the money, most of the money is going to come from and they keep on like exponentially getting richer anyway. So, um, I don't see a problem with like saying that, um, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos may have to consider that he can only possibly buy, uh, 50 yachts instead of 51 yachts or whatever, you know? Or the top 10% richest Americans can only own 50% of the stock market rather than the current 90% they own. By, by the way, I, yeah. I got to say this. The stock market is is is, is, is garbage. You know, I, I, I really hate that idea. Um, just slightly off topic. I really hate the idea that people use the stock market as kind of the um, determinant of, of economic uh, prosperity because it, it's really, really not. It's 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 not even – doesn't even scratch the surface. Um, but – the the thing here is that you can't really tax the rich into kind of solving or or helping to solve a lot of these problems because you see the rich have something that we don't real legitimate mobility you know jeff bezos doesn't like the way we do things he can leave he can literally transfer all of his assets out and go and what are we going to do are we going to to put some kind of Absolutely. sanctions on him are we going I'm sorry. So this, this, I have a solution to this. So the solution <laughs> is if you, if you're an American citizen or if you're an American based company and when our taxes go up, um, well, okay. Well, before our taxes go up, the, the law would be if you're an American citizen and an American based company and you want to relocate somewhere else and revoke your American citizenship or whatever, then you will have to pay a percentage tax on your assets because it was America that got you all of your wealth in the first place whether you be a corporation or whether you be a private citizen. You were located in America when you gained all your wealth. To, to an extent, now, now, if if there is another way we can actually um, pay for a lot of these things and also kind of punch back at, say, the Walmarts and the Costcos of, of the world, because, um, you know, Costco and all them, like I, I, like I said, being around politics, you see things, and I've seen how destructive these big box stores are, and how um, damaging they are to to neighborhoods and communities. And I mean, um, so so what I think needs to be done is that there needs to be regulations in play, or or less regulations for the smaller kind of entrepreneurs or the businesses, while keeping them strict to an extent on, on the larger corporations. Like for example, there is, um, you know, like a lot of these companies like Walmart and, and things like that up here in Canada, they have like Loblaws and that. So these guys all thrive on having um, part-time workers work with them, you know, really little to no benefits. And, and the government, you know, of course, because they get very, very, very generous donations during election times and, and other things. Um, they're they're very amicable to the uh, to the ideas of these of these companies and their lobbyists. Um, so I I think like what needs to be done um, is changes that ensure that we have more entrepreneurs coming up and less of these companies uh, like like the WalMarts and the Amazons and having a chance to to further expand in. So it's kind of like a local first policy. 
Um, I, I, I don't know what you guys think on that. That's just kind of mine. I'm, hey, after, I'm, I'm getting... after, after they respond, let's get, let's get back to the topic because it's not about yeah. economics. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, economics is tied into it, but now we're kind of like way removed from. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, yeah. Let, let let us let us go back forward into the the wonderful rabbit hole of BLM and CRT. Yeah, um, yeah. So I wanted to comment also on like the mansion controversy. Um, I don't know the specifics of this case. I read it like a, I skimmed through a couple of articles on it. Um, it, it I, I I legit don't know if like something shady is going on with that. It could be the case that it's a scam, like uh, a scam, which case um, fuck them. Uh, but. I mean, on account of doing that, but um, I don't get like the the angle that oh well, it's kind of hypocritical for them to be spending the money. Um, that seems to be um, I'm not sure what the angle. I'm not sure like what the point of that is. Does that mean that like um, are you criticizing them for not doing enough with their um, with their resources? Um, is it that uh, they should be could, should be doing a better job? Because if that's the case, then um, maybe this organization is uh, maybe this organization did something bad, but then shouldn't we look at what other BLM groups are actually doing with the money they're getting? Like, I think that like a better criticism for like a BLM organization would be, I think the same organization you're talking about. Um, and I mentioned this to Tyler, like uh, in a previous conversation, but um, they uh, decided to defend Jesse Sm- Smollett after he was convicted of uh, convicted and proven to be a fraud, which is just um, really silly. Um, and that's really stupid because basically you're saying, oh, yeah, we'll defend you no matter what, even if you like intentionally fake a crime. That, that's, that, that just seems really counterproductive. Um, but the mansion thing, um, I'm not really seeing that hurt their activism per se, except if it's a scam. If that's the case, like they're taking money that they said, oh, yeah, this will go to the organization. And then they just take that money uh, and we'll be using it for this cause. And they're just embezzling it to like buy a mansion. That would be messed up. Yeah, so far there's like nothing to confirm either way. It's just, you know, what we just see so far is like, you know, the reports that's been going on about it. So we don't really know either way, like what's happening right now. So, gotcha. Well, in that case, if it's their own money that they got, like, um, and maybe they got, and keep in mind that when with nonprofits, um, they aren't like nonprofit doesn't mean nobody gets paid any money because, of course, you have to, you get paid for your work. Like, you can't be like a full time a- activist and not get a paycheck. Um, so if they're paid legitimately and they decide, hey, I want to buy a mansion in this area, I mean, that's that's perfectly fine as far as I'm concerned. It's not counterproductive. Um, the only criticism there would be like the allocation of resources of that organization, which now, one fair of the enough. Found- yeah. Now, one of the founders like Patrice uh, Collins, I think that's Collins. Sorry, that's her name. More or less, he stated that, of course, um, she wants to abolish the police. Now, before we talk about, like, you know, abolish the police, like, how do you guys, like, uh, reality and the other person, how do you guys define abolishment? Um, I would define abolishment as complete removal of the police. Um, I would be against that. And I'm also not in favor of, like, um, the message of defunding the police. Um, I don't think that either of these strategies in terms of policy or in terms of rhetoric are going to be all that effective. Um, I do, I do believe in police, heavy police reform, but I don't think that the, I I don't think that cutting police budgets or like getting rid of police entirely is really the best way to go of going about doing things. Okay. And I guess, uh, street glad you can answer that too. Uh, wait, what was the question? Uh, what do you think about abolishing the police and how do you define abolishment? Um, well, I don't. I, I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a proponent for abolishing the police, but I think that the people who are, they come from like an anarchistic point of view where they think that oftentimes and this this is just followed by statistics as well. Oftentimes um, your local police force doesn't actually live in your community. They live outside of your community. So it's like you have an outside oppressor, if you will. And then th- these anarchists as well would believe that uh, oftentimes these oppressors just they don't make our lives better in any meaningful way. So, I, I don't know. I don't really know how to answer this question because I don't actually believe in this thing. Okay, what about you, Ernest? Um, I believe that there needs to be reforms to the police in terms of the way how they handle certain situations. Um, abolishing them, absolutely not. You know, like, um, it's, it, it's, it's just not feasible. And I, I think that it's... It's honestly just dangerous to do. 
You know, that's that that's it. Like reform them. Um, don't make them so heavily militarized because that's that's something I've noticed in the United States. You know, there are police officers driving around with like armored personnel character uh, carriers and Humvees and that. Um, I, I'm I'm really not in favor of that. I think that that's too intimidating and um, and just just not a a healthy kind of um, environment to have or or at least police yeah i remember when they abolished the police at uh, autonomous zone i cannot remember the exact name chad whatever yeah 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 more or less it was like complete anarchy (laughs) complete anarchy like i saw like the craziest videos from that place (laughs) if you want to if you want to see portland's version of that as well portland uh they took over they occupied like an entire street and they were preventing the eviction of a it was called the red house but like it was just, yeah people were getting evicted and then some anarchists straight right. up like blockaded off the street they had like spikes and shit like preventing people out from getting in oh, wow so seattle seattle's not alone with their with their own autonomous zone if you will <laughs> one had one too for like a week yeah, that's crazy. And I also remember reading some sort of data that, like, as soon as they decided to defund the police, that more or less the crimes actually increased. But I can't remember the article, but if I can find it, I'll try to send a link to you guys. Gotcha. Yeah, I remember reading something like that as well. Um, I think it I think it was an article on CNN that actually said that the fund the police actually did uh, contribute to more crimes. Like, it wasn't the only reason why there's been a recent crime wave, but that was they did cite it as, like, partially one of the reasons. Um, I'd have to take a look um, to see at the study, see exactly how much that did impact it. But yeah, it does stand to reason that like if there's less police presence in a dangerous neighborhood, you're going to have more crime. Like criminals don't stop being like criminals because you have less police. So like in some in many cases, like getting rid of police presence could be a problem. That's not to say that police presence is always justified. Um, in fact, I think that it could lead to like an escalation between like the police and, and uh, other groups of people. Um, it could be, and that would be a problem. Again, reforming police, I'm absolutely for. It's just that I don't know if like slashing the police budget is the best way of going about doing that. Um, like if it was a proposal that made sense, like for example, if they're spending all their money like um, getting like way more cops than they have to, or getting uh, way more equipment and stuff than they have to, like all this. Like I remember, like uh, um, I, like I hate to use John Oliver as a source, but a lot of times he does bring up like uh, good sources. Not always though. Um, like the, the idea that you can just like go to like buy old military hardware and equipment just seems ins- and, and use it for your police force just seems insane to me. And like the, and a lot of times you just go, Hey, cool. We can get a Humvee with this money. And it's just, that's kind of ridiculous. So if it's something that, if, so if budget slashing means getting rid of excesses like that, sure. But I'm more interested in reforming the police's behavior and actions. Um, like I'd be more in support of, of eight can't wait than, uh, defund the police. Which, um, if you don't know what that is, eight can't wait was like eight very basic um, policy changes to how the police operate on the field. Um, the most uncontroversial, of which were being body cams, and there's some other, and I forget the specifics. Of the other one, it just kind of went. It was a thing for about a couple of weeks, and then it kind of disappeared. I guess like um, I guess eight could wait. And oh wait, there was also talk of other policy proposals, like no more cho- no more chokeholds. Um, I think I would generally support that. I can't really think of a good justification for an officer like we literally put the hands uh, his hands around someone's neck, um, unless yep, it's like. Some... Go ahead. No, no, I'm just saying I agree. Yeah. Yeah, same here. Yeah, um, and the body cam thing like that should be already policy. Like the only reason oh, not I'm to sorry. do it would be, yeah, the only reason not to do it would be lack of resources, and I don't think that's the case. Like, um, why would you not want your? Uh, why as a police officer would you want to cover up what you're doing? Unless you're up to something shady, it doesn't make any sense otherwise. Like, there's yeah, just no reason. Yeah. No, so, the... so yeah. Uh, um, I mean, Ernest can go first and as a um, reality, okay? Uh, no, no, no. I'll just let him finish and then I, I'll, I'll go ahead. All right. I actually, I, I think that was just the point I wanted to make. That basically, um, I'm less interested in like cutting. I'm less interested in cutting police budgets and more interested in making sure police behavior is kept um, in check and under control and that police are held more accountable for their actions. Those I think are better reforms than cutting budgets. Um, I guess um, there's also something 
Oh, and another thing that needs to go, so long as I'm like talking about uh, good policies to be in favor of, um, the stupid warrior mentality that poli- that many police officers have, or this mythologizing of like police work, um, that needs to go away. Like, uh, you know, yes, you know, there are cops that do put themselves on the line of duty, like they they put their lives in danger when they're like, you know, under very um, um, under extreme circumstances, but that's not like the day to day police duties and jobs. Like they have all sorts of resources available to them. They're not that um, vulnerable. They're not vulnerable. Like, like we've all met cops before. Like they, they're they tend to be tough guys. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I can I can at least empathize with cops treating us like a fucking occupying military force to some regard. Having previously had friends who had the who sold drugs were driving in a car that they weren't insured for that wasn't under their name and their philosophy was if i ever get pulled over i'm just going to shoot this guy like so i don't know yeah, like that's, i don't that's, that's, i don't think it's okay that's... ever when i because i've been mistreated by the cops and i'm like a very chill dude so like i don't think it's ever okay when they mistreat people but i also i can empathize with the fear that they might have fuck dude i might just be pulling over the wrong guy today that's got that's yeah. be, that's got a wear on a person no 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 definitely definitely like i i um i i spent a year doing security in a in a really rough kind of city in northern uh canada and like i'd go to work every day and my, my company wouldn't give me like a stab vest or anything and trust me in that that place you needed it so i literally had to go around like in, in, with that in my head like am, am i going to like have to ask the wrong homeless person like to stop like sleeping in this cemetery or, or sleeping in this laundry room is he going to pull a knife and stab me in the stomach you know like i i don't know and you know you, you've got to be combative like you've almost got it when you're going into a, a a situation like that where someone's you know drunk or drugged up or 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 anything um you know you, you got to be ready for things and i've i've almost been been killed like well, at least twice um Luckily, I never got injured uh, seriously or anything like that. But I mean, like, like the danger is there. So I can understand the police um, being, um, you know, a, a little bit quick to the draw because, you know, you, you, you just really don't know. But at the, at the same time, like, like I, I think that police need to have the body cams. I, I believe that accountability and transparency are you know above all it's 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 absolutely necessary and if they say like there's there's funding issues if you can buy an armored personnel carrier and and like a couple of crates of m4s i'm pretty sure you can buy a few body cameras and and uh and a uh, a server you know it's it's Here's some... not yeah. sorry i thought you were done no 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 go on go on i'm done um, okay. Well, first, first off, I just don't know how to raise my hand on Twitter, so I'm sorry if I'm like interrupting uh, two people. To, to, to raise your hand, go to the heart symbol, and then it's like uh, the hand waving thing on the right side. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think as far as body cams, though, like the the solution, or like maybe not a solution, but something that I think we should all agree on, as far as like potential harms that could be done with body cameras. Oftentimes, what they'll do is they'll they'll add body cameras. But there will be no law stopping them from turning it off whenever the fuck they want to. So, like, if I'm a cop and I'm just about to abuse your rights, and I know I'm about to abuse your rights because I, I knew you from high school and I'm pulling you over, I'm going to turn off my camera before I abuse your rights. And there's no, like, there, there needs to be laws to prevent that from happening in the first place. As well as there needs, there needs to be laws that make, the, that make out, us as basic, basic citizens have a right to review this body camera footage um, before maybe like ourselves i guess maybe not before anyone but just like we should have equal rights to view it kind of like a kind of like a dash cam of a police car no no ab- think, absolutely and but like the, the thing is like when people advocate for body cameras oftentimes they skip over these like very important these very important issues that that more or less just quit well create create wiggle room for cops to like abuse their powers if you will or like they can before say before they release the, the body camera footage, they can selectively edit it to make it so it totally fucking favors them, and they cut out the part where they punched you, and then they only added the part where you, as an angry citizen, is reacting to a cop punching them. Like there needs to be laws that protect us. Agreed. No, no, I, I, I hope. Ab- yeah. Absolutely. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to circle jerk. Just 
I feel like that's like really important. Like a lot of people overlook that when it comes to body cameras. Um, one other thing that I can think of as a police reform um, is uh, a thing, a little thing called qualified immunity. Um, that is like that was something that the Supreme Court ruled that cops have. Like, oh well, a cop because the logic kind of makes sense because basically they don't want cops in do in performing duties of a police officer getting sued for performing duties of a police officer, right? But the problem is that the way that the courts define it is that oh well, you have to specifically tell the cop of something they're not allowed to do in order for them to be sued for violating your rights, which is just absolutely asinine ridiculous. Like, no, that shouldn't be the case. Your rights should be uh, protected regardless if the cop has been specifically told or there's a specific um, dash quota thing on the uh, uh, on telling them not to do that. Like, this isn't like... Um, this, th th their li like That level of liability protection is absolutely insane. So I'm all about, like, in, uh, either... Um, I don't think that we should absolutely abolish it because it does serve a purpose to an extent, but it should be like severely reduced. It should only be used when the cop can basically prove that, yeah, this was what my actions were necessary for performing the line of duty. And I didn't violate anyone's rights. Um, I think that's the only time when you should really be able to uh, pull the qualified immunity card out. I think to add on to that, too, I, I just I question why don't doctors have qualified immunity and why do police? Like, like, if a doctor makes a mistake while operating on my body, I'm allowed to sue him for his egregious mistake that impacted my life. Why aren't police treated the same? It just no, 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 that part just blows like, my mind. Like, like they they should definitely. Um, I, you know what? I'd I'd even like to an extent to have that towards um towards politicians in in some way, shape, or form. Um, I think um if it was easier to to sue politicians it might be a little bit easier to kind of get things um changed because i mean like that's that's one thing i know those too like like police officers politicians generally make like very big mistakes um without getting any real consequences like like, like the way that like the money that they spend on things that are just absolutely asinine um you know that's that's just my thoughts I would comment more on that, about... but oh, sorry. Would... You go. yeah, I would comment more on that, but um, we would like veer off topic quickly if I did. No, no, no. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I and... think we got it done with with B.